Okay, so last time we talked about how you can't get a sort of spontaneous magnetization in the Z2 gauge theory. <clears throat> um, so the reason is the expectation value of, of sigma Z isn't a gauge invariant quantity. So in order to say anything mean, meaningful in a pure gauge theory, like the Z2 gauge theory, you need a locally gauge invariant quantity and or a correlation function or whatever you want to call it, observable. And what we're going to look at is called the Wilson loop. <clears throat> so the Wilson loop is defined around some contour on the lattice. Remember the lattice is degrees of freedom on the, on the edges. So in this classical Z2 gauge theory, we just have to identify somehow a contour, like this orange line. We call that thing C, and that's, that's your Wilson loop. Okay, so what it is is the product of all the, remember the degrees of freedom live here, so it's the product of all these degrees of freedom. And of course, they have many shapes. They can be topologically non-trivial if this thing's on, a, on an interesting sort of manifold, like a torus or something like that. <clears throat> so the expectation value of this thing depends on the, the Basically, way that contour is defined. Okay, is that a G or a C? This? Yeah. It's a C. Contour. Sorry, I just couldn't tell. Contour. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so the expectation value depends on this. sort of, it could depend on, we're going to see it depending on the area within that contour versus the perimeter of that contour in different phases of the, of the Z2 gauge theory, of the Ising gauge theory. And that, again, if that contour is topologically non-trivial, then the Wilson loop means uh, something, says something about the topological characteristics of this model. We'll get to that too. So, just like we did for the Ising model um, on your first assignment, we're going to look at basically a series expansion um, in the low and high temperature limit of the expectation value of the Wilson group. <clears throat> Well, no. Um, yeah, it can self-intersect. It can be one plaquette. It can be, you know, well, I think the only thing you have to be careful what, with is if it winds around a, a hypertorus with your boundary condition, but we'll talk about that because that defines some topological characteristics. So are you, are you considering uh, general dimension or just 2D? General dimensions for now. And then we'll talk about 2D because it's special. So imagine 
you know, this thing can have all sorts of twists and turns and so on in general dimensions. <clears throat> Let's see, will that matter? I think it matters for the low temperature expansion of the dimension. Let's do the high temperature first. Okay, we're doing the same thing you've already done on the assignment, except the Hamiltonian is different. All right, so basically the Hamiltonian is I had a J in front of it, I don't know why. It's at J equal to 1. Sum over all plaquettes. IJKL, where these indices are within plaquettes. <clears throat> and again, the degrees of freedom. Okay, so if you do the high temperature expansion the same way that you did it for the Ising model, you're basically considering a quantity that looks like this. Let's see, there's a minus sign on front. Okay, J equals 1. So you have sigma Z, sigma Z. Where I'm just all of a sudden too lazy to write all the indices. And there's an identity because the eigenvalues of this operator are only plus or minus one. All right, so you get something that's like this plus sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, sine cinch, cinch probably. Okay, it's the same thing that you used when you had just two eyes and spins. So you pull out that Gosh data. <clears throat> and you're kind of doing a series expansion in terms of this hyperbolic tangent. So the expectation value is just going to be something like Right, so you just calculate a trace over that thing. Um, sigma z i, that's i in the contour. Remember, you still have to always define the contour. It's not all, it's not like it's all sigma z i on the lattice. It's just however you define that weird c. Oh, and then what else? Uh, let's see. Something like the sum over all plaquettes. That hyperbolic cosine will cancel from the numerator and denominator. Oops, I forgot my 10. <clears throat> mm hmm. Trace of that thing, and the uh, the partition function is just. I don't even see this. <clears throat> Something like that. So I'm not going to do everything. Um, so what you do is you basically expand in powers of, or you have all these products, right? So you have all these products in this term, and you're expanding in powers of the hyperbolic tangent. Trace. You have terms that are like sum over 
Um, right. All the all the microstates, all the states associated with some sigma z, right? So plus or minus one. Sigma. So you always have terms like that. Anytime you have a standalone, call it index i, I guess, this term uh, sums to zero. This is plus one, minus one. When, when is it non-zero? When can you get a non-zero contribution? We did this, I think, right? So if you, if you have an element of your trace that's uh, like any time an element of your trace is squared, right? <clears throat> oh, one. <laughs> so in order to get a non-zero contribution, you have to have that index occurring twice so that this, the eigenvalue is squared. I can't remember if everybody got that wrong in the assignment or not. <clears throat> so these non-zero contributions come well, okay. I'll show you. So the first one the first non vanishing non zero contribution. So, let me draw it here. So, you have a Wilson loop defined somehow. I don't know. <clears throat> and you have, sigmas, you have sigma i's on the boundary, right? Um, so those will be like the the terms that come from this piece here, and then every time you have a plaquette, you'll you know you'll count that thing say twice. So for example, say I include this plaquette in my sum, right? Then I get one contribution to this uh, trace from the sigma z that's on the contour, so one from this guy. And then one from one of the sigma z's that's inside here. So then this one will occur twice. All right? This one will occur twice. But these ones will only occur once. So you have to include another plaquette here. All right? This one will occur twice. Now this one's been counted twice. All right? But these two have only been counted once. <clears throat> okay, so the non zero contribution only happens when you include all these plaquettes that are bounded by the Wilson loop. That's the simplest, that's a, like the first order contribution. Ooh. sum for each uh, each one of those <clears throat> each one of those plaquettes each of you know four operations for each one of those plaquettes bounded by C. So what does that term look like? Um, well okay we'll just all we have to do is basically count count that number. So let me let me see. C. So there's nine of them there. Then you get a power 
of the hyperbolic tangent for each one of those. I think it's the same as, same as you did for the Eigen model. Okay, so you can basically write this. Let's just pull this out front. Then. Log tan h beta. So you can write it as the exponential of the area of that Wilson loop times some function. So you'll, is this thing exploding as, when the Wilson loop gets bigger? No, because this thing's bounded by one, right? So it's always less than one and log, log of something less than those negative. So generally you'll get e to the minus some function of beta a. So if you go to higher orders in the expansion, this is sort of just the first order term. You just ex you'll get something that just has a more non-trivial function of beta. So it's the area bounded by the contour. <clears throat> okay, so this is called the area law. So we ho we're hoping that the area law, so exactly this statement, holds for some finite non-zero temperatures. But we'll talk about that a bit more. This is not the same area law as the area law of entanglement entropy, which is confusing, or the area law of black hole entropy. <clears throat> it's basically completely different. <laughs> I'll encounter the entanglement entropy of the Torah code. It has an area law, so it's also confusing in that sense. Okay, so that's the low temperature expansion. Let's do the high temperature expansion. So the way we'll do this is picking a representative configuration. So in the Ising model, you had like, just all up or all down, right? Here you have this massively, or this extensively degenerate manifold of states. So you can just choose a representative configuration from that. Right? Yep. So you mentioned last class that the expectation value of any non invariant variant operator has to be zero. Mm -hmm. Now suppose I take a Wilson loop that has an area of the size of the system. Then this seems to be zero, isn't it? So if you have a finite open boundary lattice, yeah. So you have to, see, you have to. I think you have to worry about how you define your lattice. You know, do you do you include these dangling bonds or not? Okay. I think if it's inside, like if it's like inside like this, it's right. fine. But if you this boundary condition, I think means something different. Okay. So you have to be careful about that because. Then you don't have the vertex operator, you don't have the gauge operators defined on that oh, on that yeah, line, yeah. right? Sure. So you have to be a little bit careful with that, yeah. 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 So if you do it like this and you're within that the yeah, dangling okay. bonds, then you're okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so low temperature, let's pick a representative state. Then the expansion, just like in the Ising model, proceeds in like the droplet sense. So you just flip a number, you know, you flip one spin, you flip two spins, you flip all these spins. And that's the that's the higher order terms of your expansion. So oops. Okay, so choose one member of that manifold 
doesn't matter which one, but if you choose all spins up, all spins down or whatever, I don't know, all spins down. It's easy to draw. So on some hypercube, that would be all spins down. Five dots everywhere, that's all spins up. So the series expansion proceeds by you know, making droplets by just flipping single spins, is your lowest order. So what we want to do is calculate <clears throat> So well, basically the same expectation value as I've written over there, but that, that exponential, we'll just leave it as the exponential. So from this droplet expansion, Be one flip spin. Hmm. So this depends on the on dimension. The ener the energy of this excitation. So if you're in three D, that's that's a ground state configuration. Remember, my Hamiltonian is defined on plaquettes, so it depends on the coordination number of like the the edges. If I flip one spin out of the all spin down state, then the energy, uh, okay, so then in, the, in 3D, in 2D it's two plaquettes are frustrated, in 3D it's four and so on. So this frustrates. Frustrates means brings it out of the, the uh, its preferred low energy configuration. Uh, so it should be 2 to the d minus 1. <clears throat> right, and the energy, again, the energy just comes from, right, the Hamiltonian terms that are unsatisfied in those plaquettes. It's a cost. Oh, so this is a 4 d minus 1. This is what's occurring in the exponential, say times about beta. Okay? And you can keep doing that. You can do multiple isolated spins. You can do pairs of spins that are connect, connected in some nearest neighbor sense. So let me write out what happens. Okay, so... So, when you write out the, the expectation value, it, it matters whether or not the, the, the droplet spin occurs on the contour. Okay, this is a little different than the Ising model. So it matters whether or not the droplet you choose to precipitate is out here, or whether it's on, uh, on the orange contour. And so it's only when it's on the contour that the expectation value is different than one. function first. So just like in the Isaac case, I'll, I'll pull out the, the ground state energy piece. So it's something like, I don't know, number of plaquettes and that sum, beta, I guess. That's sort of the form of your expansion. And the lowest order term from the single spin that's been flipped. All right, so it's going to be the energy for d minus 1 beta plus higher order terms from more droplets that have been flipped 
And there's a like combinatorial term for all the different uh, positions. So if we don't just consider positions on the contour, I mean in the, in the numerator, sorry, in the denominator, there's no there's no uh, expectation value term. So there's just something like n number of what what do I call these bonds? Number of links to go in front of that. Sometimes it's easier to label these objects with a dimension. That could be n1. Then the number of plaquettes would be n2. And the number of vertices, right, like these objects, would just be n0. I think it's a zero dimensional object. <clears throat> so just keep track of the different n's. So that's the uh, number of links, number of, yeah, so then the, the numerator. So the expansion is affected by that sigma i, z, which, you, which can be on the contour or not on the contour. Uh, sigma z, one, two, three, four. Okay, so it's, it's plus one, unless that's the droplet spin, right? Based on the analogous expansion of the numerator, J and P beta. <laughs> okay, so you have a term that's like this. Uh, every time that this is plus one for G minus one beta. So it has to be off the contour. So let's give the contour a length, and we'll call it uh, big L. I haven't used that yet. So in this case, it's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, say. sense to me. Make sense? <clears throat> that's that's your lowest order term. So you just keep going with this series expansion. So one thing that's different is you can you can you can uh, sum the contributions for all the basically um, independent single spin flips. Okay, so you can imagine flipping you know one you drop this one spin on one plaquette or one series of plaquettes and then another spin that's like far removed. So this didn't give a contribution to the free energy in the Eisen case. But here you're going to resum all of these contributions. So I need some number, small n, independent spin flips. Independent means they're removed from each other. They don't have to be that far removed; just they just can't share any plaquettes. So then, basically, this type of contribution, um, say, say, you look at the, if you look at the contribution in the partition function, it's easier. You just have an energy, which is just n times this energy up in the exponential, and then this combinatorial 
common clerical factor has to be what, like big N or number of bonds choose small n. Uh, on. Right, so it's something like that. So it's like number of bonds, n choose n, uh, e to the minus that thing times n, or e minus 1 theta. And that n choose n, oops, that's pretty much equal to. It's 1 over. 1 over n factorial, and it's like nb minus 1, nb minus 2. It's pretty much nb factorial. Why not? Close enough. 4 b minus 1 beta. Not exactly equal to that. But I like that because then it, it makes the sum look like something I can re exponentiate. Terms like that in the numerator. Okay, so you can re exponentiate all this, and if you did it, you'll find something that depends on. Um, I'll write it like this. So you'll re exponentiate. This, these terms up into a, an exponent, which is pretty weird. So let me just call it e to the some function of beta times L. Perfectly rigorous. Basically, the, basically, there's just the only point is that that L gets pulled up into the exponential. Right. So, what does it mean that there is a temperature in which the dependence changes from length to area? Right. So this this is called the perimeter law. So j that's right. Just just like in the Ising model, you know you. The, that intuition is correct. You basically have two regimes for this, this Z2 gauge theory. All right, so by the way, if you do this right, you'll still get the perimeter law. It's just you know the first order sort of approximation, but trust me. <laughs> This holds. So the two temperature regimes are high temperature, low temperature. It's like the exponential decay of the Wilson loop qualitatively changes to go from the perimeter to the area.
Bad high temperature. We'll talk about this, but this is the equivalent of the confinement phase, or confined phase. From the uh, U1 gauge theory, <clears throat> but for low temperatures, you have the minus L. E confinement. Confinement and deconfinement of what? We'll talk about it. It's the equivalent of the, um, it's the analogy of like the, um, say, electro, uh, electric charge in the U1 theory. <clears throat> right, so even though you don't have an order parameter that's like a conventional order parameter, you can still have a phase transition. So who said you need an order parameter for a phase transition? That's basically the point. Isn't there with this already like an order parameter? You, you see everybody that did change between the two regimes. Yeah, so it's just some highly non-local yeah. thing. By non-local you mean that it's going to rather that at yeah. a point. So you can actually do like a duality transformation mm -hmm. um, on this model and turn into, you know, if you can identify sort of what, what the this non-local order parameter is, you can do like a duality transformation and make it look like an Ising model. But that transformation is highly non-local. So that's that's all it is. So it actually is dual to an Ising model, or that, that phase transition is dual to a, an Ising transition. But one important caveat is that it's not true in all dimensions. Um, so even though this argument has D in it, uh, you have to be more careful than this when you look at the confinement or deconfinement transition for these gauge theories. And the special case is, actually the most interesting case is two dimensions. So let's just talk a little bit about 2D. And again, we'll rely on all that intuition from the first few weeks of class. And let's do like a, let's just think of like a Pyrrhal's instability type argument. Uh, for this gauge theory. So in 2D, you have, I, I draw, uh, these pictures I draw quite a bit in, in 2D. Um, they're the easiest ones to get a sort of intuition for. But recall, So recall this argument of Pyrrhal Z in 1D. So this is for the Ising model, okay? the usual Ising model. You have spin states that have some sort of uh, droplet that's defined by a zero dimensional defect boundary, if you want to call it that. The boundary between the droplet of the minority phase and the majority phase is zero dimensional. So then the energy cost of those domain walls is just some constant, four, two, whatever. That's one D. In 2D, okay, well, okay, so let me keep going with 1D. So the free energy, I'm trying to remember how this works, E minus TS, 
Well, yeah, it was 4j minus t, say, and then there's this entropy term, which turned out to be looking like a log. <clears throat> so for non-zero temperature, there's always droplets of some length. Remember that want to proliferate through the system. And so Pyro's argument for the 1D Ising model said that this proliferation of minority defects destroys the majority phase. was the, the defect boundary, you know, picks up, so in two dimensions it picks up an L term. And what that L term in the energy allows you to do is balance or offset the, the entropy uh, uh, term, right? So. Well, whatever. So your minority phase looks like this. This is your boundary. Right, so that's that was the argument, the Pyrrhal's argument for a critical temperature. Okay, so. You're balancing E and the PS term, the free energy. All right, so think of your, think of your 2D Z2 gauge theory now. Let me, let me imagine I'm doing like that low temperature series expansion and I'm going to proliferate droplets. So I, I, I create a defect there, I flip that spin and this is my energetically unsatisfied plaquette, and this is my energetically unsatisfied plaquette. I can flip another spin. I can flip another spin. I can move this thing far away. So there's some minority, there's some defect, if you will, um, that's like these X's you should think of like basically these red lines here. There's no energetic confinement between those things and they're zero dimensional. So. So what happens is the entropy of putting those things in can never be balanced by, and there's no temperature that balances the energy and the entropy. And so for any finite temperature, it turns out that this two-dimensional Z2 gauge theory actually is confined. It has the area law piece. So this deconfinement-confinement transition 
happens at zero temperature in two dimensions. That's another way of saying that. Same as the Ising model, the transition only happens at zero temperature, say. So you have to go to three dimensions. If you go to three dimensions, then the, the domain walls or whatever become one dimensional. They become like one dimensional lines. And then you can get an energy entropy balance. You can draw out the defect boundaries in higher dimensions. <clears throat> and by just by this simple Parles argument, you know, you could imagine that this uh, te transition temperature exists. And in fact, in 3D, I, I, I don't know if you can do it analytically. There's a duality transformation. Um, yeah, I think if you basically do a duality transformation from this loop variable non locally to an Ising model. Uh, then you can basically see that that model is the 3D Ising model, which has a phase transition. And I know the transition temperature is dual, uh, dual to that phase transition in 3D. I think one point, uh, geez, I think it's 313. Is that 313 or 131? It's in the universality class of the 3D Ising. That means anything to you. So if you look at the specific heat, in particular, and calculate the critical exponents from the specific heat, you get the critical exponents of the 3D Ising transition. So it tells you that there's some duality going on there. The specific heat's really all you have. So you can look at the specific heat, you can look at Wilson loop expectation values, something like a topological entanglement entropy, but um, it's not a, you know, it's, it's kind of a subtle transition. In, in 4D, so D greater than or equal to 4, uh, this transition becomes strongly first order. Just fluctuations make it first order. I don't know why it just happens. I only know because... I simulated with, with Monte Carlo. You see this massive uh, latent heat. So this dimensionality, this is why your surface codes or your quantum, your memory is only stable in 3D or higher, right? So for these, for anything that's two-dimensional, what do you call it? You have to have active error correction or whatever. You have to actively be fixing all of these types of errors. But if you were in three dimensions, you would have some regime of stability, um, uh, you know, up to, up to the t temperature that's given by that phase transition. <clears throat> Crazy? Oh yeah, well, might as well talk about that, so. So what am I talking about? So let's imagine, let's, let's talk a little bit about the topology of, of the Wilson loops. So the Wilson loops have just been these, we've just imagined these kind of things that have an area and a perimeter, and we define the size of them, and then we look at the way the expectation value falls off. Um, so let's, let's look at the topology. <clears throat> so the simplest way to imagine this is to just stick to two dimensions, okay? And take your Wilson loop, and 
stretch it across the entire system. So it's easiest to picture the thing being on a torus. And I can find my Wilson loops. And it's traversing <clears throat> So here's a small torus. One, two, three, four by four vertices. One, two, three, four by four plaquettes. So we can imagine this one connecting to this one. Right? This one connect to this one. This one connected to this one. <clears throat> so, just, so that's a torus. I can define Wilson loops in the usual way, except instead of being closed, you know, in a simply connected way, they have this non-trivial topology. So they give you a contour around the x direction, or I got a contour around the y direction. Right, so they're like a string of operators, or a string of sigma z's. They're non-contractible because of this. Hmm, A or I? So, for whatever contour, cx or cy, The value of, of the Wilson loop can't be changed by any number of local gauge operations or gauge transformations. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can illustrate that. So I've got a Wilson loop that was defined, um, right? So I have degrees of freedom on all these bonds, one, two, three, four. So if I define my Wilson loop as the product of those four, <coughs> bonds, or five, one, two, three, four, five, periodically, oh, that's a bad number. Okay, let's see what happens. <coughs> if I perform a gauge flip, which is defined as a vertex operation, right? Yeah, so I pick a vertex and I flip all the um, spins associated. Let's pick this vertex, I don't know. I want to I want to somehow affect it. Yeah, that has to be this one, I guess. One, two, three, four. Yeah, okay. So I flip those spins, so I've picked up, you know, um, this, this is a minus sign, this is a plus sign, this is a plus sign, this is a minus sign. It always occurs in pairs, no matter where I pick that vertex. So that, that this thing is invariant. Under local, you know, gauge transformations. So it's only a non-local operation that can that can change that that value, the value of that Wilson loop. So the non-local operation would be something like <coughs> taking you know, the, taking a string operator which winds around this direction in its entirety and flipping all the spins 
um, in that loop. And if you do it in terms of pairs, I don't know, maybe I need another pi, I don't know, whatever. Doesn't matter. If you do it in terms of pairs, then all the plaquettes remain satisfied energetically. But you pick up one extra minus sign in your Wilson loop. Takes whatever the value of that Wilson loop is and, and flips the sign of it. But it's a non-local operation. Okay, so that's sort of your that's your, that's your basically topological bit. It's the value of those Wilson loops, those non-contractible Wilson loops. And there's two Wilson loops in each direction, so there's four different what they call topological sectors for the Z2 gauge theory. So it depends on, yeah, it's defined on the dual lattice, it's just a product of sigma x's or whatever you want to call it. It's a product of spin flips around the dual. I'm going to put a quantum term in the Hamiltonian next. It becomes a little more obvious. So it's just a product of these, these errors, these, these spin flips. <clears throat> so if you take these values of the Wilson loop, it defines these four topological sectors. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one. Okay, and each one of those is a, a measure of, a, say, a topological bit of information. So if you want to create a, if you want to create a, a classical memory that's robust against local perturbations, so stray fields, so you want to create a hard drive, you know, which is usually bits are encoded as groups of uh, ferromagnetic spins either pointing up or down, or something like that. So if you had one ferromagnetic spin, um, it would, you know, it would, and you don't have any redundancy in it, you would get. You get logical errors by any sort of spin flip oper single spin flip operation. In this case, a single spin flip operation would only screw up sort of one of your Wilson loops. But you could define L by L Wilson loops, right? And so if you look at, say, the average of L by L of all the Wilson loops, then that single spin flip uh, wouldn't destroy the topological state. You need an entire non-local operation in order to flip the bit. So that's behind proposals for these types of DG gauge theories for classical fault tolerant or hardware fault tolerant classical memory. Then of course if you want to define a temperature, it has to be in three dimensions. So let's let's make a true gauge theory, just like we did for the U1 gauge theory, by adding another term to the Hamiltonian. And this little this is what they call the torque code. Okay, tie up the torque code. <clears throat> okay, so I still have, I'm just going to look at the square lattice. Mostly. So I still have degrees of freedom on, on the bonds. I have I have an object which is like the plaquette, which defines the sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z. But I'm also going to use the zero dimensional vertex to define uh, a product of operators in the Hamiltonian. I guess I'll call them A for the vertex, B for the plaquette. I don't want to get this backwards. So the plaquette was sigma z's. 
So the vertex is sigma x's. Okay, so one, two, three, four, three, four. The plec x is the usual thing. You label it with P, one, two, three, four. And the vertex is labeled with V, but it still is a product of four operators. One, two, three, four. In whatever order you need, to make yourself happy. <clears throat> so unlike the U1 gauge theory, again, there's no direction on these links. They're just Ising, straight up Ising variables. So in the Hamiltonian, the, the Torah code is just sum over all vertices. And the term that we had before, which was like sum over all plaquettes, B for the plaquette. And now in higher dimensions, there's different ways to define these, these Torah code Hamiltonians, if you will. So there, in three dimensions, for example, even though your B still has four um, spins associated with it, your vertex operator would have one, two, three, four, would have six spins, six sigma C's, six sigma X's. That's one version of one of these so-called stabilizer codes in higher dimensions. You can also have, uh, you can also have uh, the plaquette term uh, turning into a higher dimensional term. So in a four dimensional code, you can have a plaquette term. You can either have a vertex term that picks up another pair of bonds for the fourth dimension and keep the plaquette term. You're gonna have both of them being on the analog and you know the equivalent of like three dimensional objects. <clears throat> So in higher dimensions, it gets a little complicated, the sort of the geometry. And each one of these different stabilizer codes in higher dimensions has different sort of properties. There's different phase transitions and so on associated with these things. But okay, so let's see what this vertex term does to the ground state. Because the ground state is this extensively degenerate manifold where all of these plaquette terms are satisfied. Okay, but that's a classical model. This is now a quantum mechanical model. So the first thing, since each one of these operators shares either zero links or shares two links, you know, a vertex and this plaquette share two links, that means they commute. Position of the vertex or plaquette. And obviously, each interaction term commutes with the Hamiltonian because the Hamiltonian is made up out of them. So it's just like the U1 gauge theory in this limit where U was zero, I think it was called. All you have to do is satisfy individually each, each one of these two Hamiltonian terms, and you'll find a ground state of this, of this Hamiltonian or this model. So they all commute and commute with H. Here's just draw a couple out, you'll see that that's true. So because of this commutation, just minimize the energy, which means maximizing, you know, because there's minus signs, maximizing each term. And the eigenvalues, because this is your poly operators, are just plus or minus one. Right? So what you want is 
all plus ones for every one of these things, and that'll minimize the energy term. Okay, so it's another nice feature of gauge theory is that you can, you can basically solve these things exactly in some limits. So in the ground state, we basically want the eigenvalues um, I don't know, for each one of these on every plaquette. To be plus one, which is just returning back a wave function for all vertices and plaquettes. So let's keep looking at the sigma z basis, just like we have been. Okay, so we're going to draw dots for sigma z plus one and nothing for sigma z minus one. So now I have to choose a basis, right? So in this basis, We can define a special Wilson loop that's just the flux through a plaquette. I can call it small w. <clears throat> and it depends on it depends on the spin state. So if I have the small plaquette. Sigma z j, right, for uh, a given plaquette, then I can call this operator with expectation value 1 of uh, vortex. No, let's call it minus 1. And the philosophy is that we have a vacuum state where each, each plaquette has satisfied its interactions, right? And if I flip a spin, I create two vortices, right? One in one plaquette, one in, in, in its neighbor. So the ground state has to be the state where all of these small little Wilson loops um, don't have any vortices. So the condition It holds only if the ground state. Oh, oh, how am I going to say this? So. For all spin states, uh, let's see. <laughs> Every vortex um, is equal to one for all plaquettes. Oh, Whatever, it's done. Some coefficient. And I want to label all the spin states. I'll call it S. All the sigma z states. So these would all, you can imagine these being all these. You know, this is like a superposition of all the extensively degenerate manifold that classically we consider to be vortex free or to have no energetic electric particle or whatever the hell I was calling it. So that's a ground state. The question is what are the coefficients, the expansion coefficient C for all these different spin states? And that comes from the condition on the operator A, the vertex operator. All right, so what does that do? 
It's like our gauge move that we define in the classical case, but it's energetic now. That's what this model is. Just gives an energy to the gauge move. So this flips. Vertex. So we also have to have the condition that when we operate on that wave function by A, um, that we're always getting a plus one out. Okay. And that thing only holds if all the C's are equal. Because when you operate by that stabilizer, by that Hamil that vertex Hamiltonian, you'll, you'll move around in the different spin states. It's different at sigma z states, right? Uh, because it's a sigma x product of sigma x operators. So you'll change the wave function unless all those things are weighted equally in the superposition. So all the CS are equal to 1. So, I don't know if I, uh, I don't know if I did this last time, I forget. But you can imagine an element of this uh, superposition. So, you can imagine this, an S state. How would you create that? Well, this is one. All the sigma z, state, all the sigma z states are down. If I want to create another one, well, I flip that spin, but it creates defects. So I start chasing this defect around. I just keep pushing it around, right? So the only way that I can close that, that zero-dimensional defect boundary is by making a loop, something like that. I don't know, I could do, I could do another one. I could do a non-contractible -contra one. Yeah, so that loop, it has to be of the size of the system. It doesn't have to be the size of the system. I could have a loop that's like this. So doesn't that make the... Oh, no. The, 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 like it's like frustrated. Yeah, I did it wrong. It has to be a product of, of uh, vertex operators, right? So. so let's see. Let's see if I can do this right. Okay, so there's two vertex operators right next to each other. That's everything that there is satisfied. So that's the product of all the, you know, that's the product of, I could, I could like undo these ones. So that's another, that's another yeah. one, right? So you, basically what this is, is like, maybe I called this before, but it's like a loop gas, right? So each element of that S, so the wave function, is just the sum of all loops. I don't know, some of all I weird loops. I, I guess I shouldn't have even tried. And it's an equal weight superposition. So it's the empty, the vacuum, you know, one loop, I don't know, two loops, and so on. That is a consequence for the entanglement entropy, which I'll maybe get to next time. <clears throat> Um, what else is interesting? What about the degeneracy of the state? Oh yeah, so it's no longer degenerate. That's important, right? It's an equal weight superposition of all these things. There's no classical degeneracy anymore. There's just one state, and it's this state, right? So the, the degeneracy is the entropy. If you measure the entropy of the ground state, that extensive degeneracy is just a feature of the classical classical model. Uh, That's the difference between classical gauge theories and these types of quantum gauge theories. I, I but think. Here, here you never specify the boundary conditions, right? And the Tori yeah. code is like a prime example of having degeneracy when you change the boundary conditions. So what happens if I have like periodic boundary conditions? Sorry, yeah, so there's a topological degeneracy, um, which is just this degeneracy here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's only defined via top uh, non-trivial topology. So, um, 
Yeah, okay, so that's a that's a definition of topological order. Yeah. So the ground state's uniquely determined, I would say. Let's do this for But Um, so the topological degeneracy comes in play for the non-contractible Wilson loops. So imagine a torus. Just like we did over there. <clears throat> um, it's basically the same, you know, it's the same idea. You have you can have L1 this way, you can have L2 this way. So for those Wilson loops, uh, there's, you know, There's eigenvalues W L one W L two say, which are both equal to either plus or minus one. Then you need a non contractible string of operators. Did I write it somewhere? To go you need a non contractible basically set of sigma x's or sigma z's to go around the torus in order to flip the value of e e any one of those um, non-contractable Wilson loops. So. so on the torus, they all have equal energy, but the ground state is fourfold degenerate. This is what they mean by topological order. So it's a quantum thing. So it means that you have basically this fourfold type topological degeneracy, or it could be higher depending on the genus of your surface and so on. And there's a gap to excitations. Right? So there's some gap that costs you, say, two times one <laughs> for every time that you flip a single spin. Uh, they're using a sigma x or a sigma uh, z operator. Okay. So that degeneracy is you know, sort of protected by a gap. Uh, you, have to, you have to flip a spin and then flip a whole string of spins all the way around the system. And, and you know, it traverses basically one of the directions in order to flip yourself into one of, one of the other topological sectors. It's basically the idea behind the topological Qubit. So, some more question. So, but yeah. like, did you mean that uh, these operators associated to these non contractible loops uh, commute with the Hamiltonian, and that's where you can see the degeneracy? Or... The, the value of that Wilson loop, whether or not it's plus, plus or minus one, the, there's no energy difference between the values of those states, but you have to. You know, you have to create a defect. So say you're in the zero, zero state, and you want to flip to the one, zero state or something like that. You have to create a defect that's energetic, so there's a gap to it. And you got to keep creating this thing until it annihilates itself. So there's a barrier. There's like an energy barrier. You know, like your energy has these four topological sectors. And you have to get it around this energy barrier that's a size two or something like that, or four, 
2J or K or whatever so to get to those other sectors. So you can't distinguish between this degenerate ground state that or this uh, four states by local moves, right? You have to wind around. Yeah. The yeah, you have to in order to, to in order to to distinguish, you need to define say the the Wilson loop, which is the so you're in the sigma z basis. You need the product of all sigma z's around the non-contractible loop, right? So you have to you have to look at the product of all the sigma z's in some non-contractible loop in order to see which one of those four sectors you're in. Yeah. So the object which tells you that you're in, you know, one of these uh, fourfold degenerate states is non-local, and the operation to jump between the fourfold degenerate states is also non-local. So this is why it's, this is why this is robust against local. This is why they call it like hardware fault tolerance, right? Because it's a robust against robust against sort of local uh, spin flips. And so, so actually, if you want air protection against spin flips and phase flips, I guess I'll talk about anions next time. Um, you 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 need to have you know you need to have one of these these Tor codes that you know this argument also holds for. Um, the sigma x operators, if you will, but the defect boundary is different between sigma z and sigma x. So remember, I told you you need you need a three-dimensional classical code in order to have one-dimensional defect boundaries. But if you want a torque code, if you want a quantum model that has one-dimensional defect boundaries um, for both spin flip and if you want to call it phase flip, the sigma x errors, then 3D is not enough. So this Hamiltonian it has plaquettes in 2D, but this 3D vertex isn't enough because this thing still has, in the dual lattice, it still has um, zero-dimensional boundaries. So you need a four-dimensional torque code in order to have, um, you know, to, to be robust against errors at finite temperature in both in both phase and, and spin. So this is, you know, Daniel Gottesman and Prestel worked on this uh, quite a while ago. I think this is probably Gottesman's thesis. So that's why John Von Haas code, the 3D cubic code, they call it, which corrects against both types of errors is such, such a big deal, sort of. Because people wanted to, for years, wanted to find a three-dimensional uh, you know, stabilizer code that, that could work for, for topological quantum computing. OK, so I'll talk a little bit about maybe anions. And uh, I wouldn't mind deriving a topological entanglement entropy for the Tor code. And we'll do that. I guess it's the last class a week from today. All right? See you guys then.